Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to yet more Warhammer Fantasy Lore, where today we are going to be talking about Gospador lore, in contrast to the Ungol lore video I already made. But before that, a uh, small update on the uh, Better Ice Guard project, quote unquote, I suppose. Here is a second drawing of our Ice Guard member. A slightly different take, this one, although it still maintains the general ideas of the first one. You can see that here the artist has added in a long braid, since that apparently was something that Slavic women took a great deal of pride in back in the day. She's also received a gambeson in addition to her regular armor, both to keep her warm and to add a little bit of extra protection. She's also got a bit more of a boar poker spear rather than the pike-ish weapon of the first iteration, and she also carries a secondary weapon in the form of a long-bladed spear. Saber. In short, she looks absolutely awesome, and again, in my non too humble opinion, infinitely superior to Games Workshop alternatives so far. If you agree, then please do feel free to share the likeness around a little bit, and again, maybe, just maybe, we can reach some ears that matter on this subject, because again, if we are going to see the return of Warhammer Fantasy, it is imperative that it is actually Warhammer Fantasy, and not Age of Sigma, with the magic dialed down from a thousand to merely 999. Anywho, I'll let this stay up on screen for a little bit as I move into the topic of today's video, Gospador Law, because uh, she is quite topical, is she not? Now, what is it that makes Gospador law so different from Ungol law, and why are there two sets of laws in the first place? Well, I touched upon this already a little bit in the Ungol video, but assuming you didn't watch it, allow me to give you a brief update. The lands of Kislev are broadly divided in two spheres of society, two different cultural groups. The Ungols, the original inhabitants of Kislev, and the Gospodors, the invaders from the south that came in and conquered the lands. These days, these two groups live more or less in perfect harmony alongside one another in the unified nation of Kislev. But, of course, this harmony did not come without some costs, without some concessions on both sides. And one of the most wide-reaching of these compromises is a pledge by one of the old Tsars to allow the Ungol people to maintain their own set of laws. This means that no Ungol individual can be brought to account in a Gospador law, or be held responsible for crimes under Gospador law. However, there is one exception, introduced by the Tsarina Katarina. She has introduced legislation that allows any Ungol family or individual that wishes for it to apply to change his legal status from that of Ungol to Gospador, at least as far as the law is concerned. The Tsarina then personally needs to approve this change in status, and thereafter the individual is judged by Gospador law and not Ungol law. Incidentally, there exists no process in which a Gospador individual may apply to be tried under Ungol law, and no way to reverse one's legal status from Gospador back to Ungol again. And that kind of thinking should give you a little idea of what the Tsarina's law is like. Katerina is probably one of the most authoritarian rulers to have ever possessed the title of Tsar, and that is saying something. Gospodor law is essentially whatever the Tsar says, although it is codified and it is written down, but the Tsarina can at any point in time simply just change the law if it so pleases her, since it is at the end of the day her word that is law. 
And considering that Tsarina's inclination towards centralization and increasing her own authority at the expense of the boyars and the lesser nobles, it should come as small surprise that considerable portions of Gospodor law pertains to the behavior of the various social classes in society, with the Tsarina, fortunately enough, being at the top of the pile, of course. Lucky that. <laughs> Anywho, the codified nature of Gospodor law does mean that it has a lot more in common with the Empire's legal system than that of the Ungols, but the resemblance more or less stops right there, in that Gospodor law is codified, it is written down, and the judges must abide by the law. They must study it, and they must interpret it in accordance with the Tsarina's wishes, although there is still a fair bit of wiggle room in the interpretation. But beyond the basic ideas like it being written down and properly codified, the resemblances between Empire law and Kislev law are few and far between. Kislev is a highly stratified society, with different ranks of nobles holding different degrees of power over one another, with the Tsarina, as mentioned, at the absolute apex of this pyramid. Criticizing the Tsarina, or speaking ill of the Tsarina, or in any way suggesting that she might be better off not being the Tsarina, are all considered high crimes against the Kislevitz state, punishable by any and all means the Tsarina deem appropriate. Quite literally, if somebody says that the Tsarina's nose looks a little bit funny this particular evening, that is more than enough of the crime for the Tsarina to put them to death. Although, she does also understand that being quite so heavy-handed is usually not a good idea. The Tsarina uses these extreme laws as a cudgel, as a threat, rather than as a blade. The fact that the Tsarina could have you executed for talking out against her will prevent most people from opening their mouths too uh, publicly. And if they should do so, well, the Tsarina can appear gracious by tolerating it. Or not, depending on her mood and the status of the individual in question. For example, doubting behaviour from the nobles is very rarely tolerated in any real amount. Whereas questions from the peasantry, grumbling in the local bars or complaints about high taxes, these things are usually overlooked, even when they are observed directly by the Tsarina's Czechists. Of course, any actual opposition to her reign or suggestion that she might be dethroned is cracked down upon with immediate and brutal force, but the Tsarina understands that the lesser people must be allowed their grumbles on occasion. This uh, remarkable degree of leniency as well, <laughs> not just flat-out executing people for bitching occasionally, <laughs> has also had a uh, unlooked-for, albeit welcome, side effect. For shit, as they say, rolls downhill. And so the more the Tsarina abuses the nobles, the more they in turn abuse the peasantry. And boy, is it within their power to abuse them most viciously. There are very, very few things that a noble-born individual can't do to a peasant. In fact, it is literally the law that if anything a peasant does inconveniences a noble in any way, no matter how imaginary on behalf of the noble, then the peasant has to stop what he's doing and change it to please the noble. And this power is pretty much limitless. If a noble takes offence at the way a certain peasant, for example, walks down the street, he can order him to get down on all fours and walk like a dog if he so pleases. And the peasant can't say anything back. Now, criticising the nobility is not illegal 
technically speaking, as long as the nobility don't find it inconvenient, but disrespecting them or disobeying them in any way, that is illegal. And a peasant is expected to always make way for the nobles, always speak politely, and always do everything within their power to accommodate those of a high-born birth. And the only scenario in which a peasant can be considered to be at the very least on somewhat kinder, maybe mildly, the same basis as a noble, is if the noble requests of the peasant hospitality. Bearing in mind that the noble could simply just order the peasant to offer up anything and everything he's got, if it so pleases him, but should the noble go out of his way to be kind and generous and, you know, a people's person, then he may request hospitality from a peasant. Now, there are no laws in Gospodor law that dictates that you must offer hospitality when requested, but there are several laws surrounding the giving of hospitality, or more precisely, the protection of the one offering. To return to our uh, highly fictive and imaginative scenario where the noble decides to ask rather than take, if the peasant then chooses to indeed offer hospitality, then as far as the law is concerned, they are now equals. And in the case of a peasant offering hospitality to another or receiving it, whichever party is offering is to be treated like a noble until the hospitality ends. So you must speak to them uh, with respect, you must abide by any and all decisions that they make, and you must do anything and everything within your power to accommodate them in return. As a uh, thank you, you could say. Again, of course, whilst this technically could place a peasant at the same stance as a noble, it will only actually ever happen if the noble chooses to allow it to happen, so it's a bit of a moot point, but hey, at least there is the possibility of a limited equality. That's something, isn't it? And there is also one other potential way in which a peasant could uh, strike back at the upper classes, but it is a very um, rare and dangerous one. You see, there is such a concept as a legal feud within Gospodor law. This does not actually refer to a legal dispute, but a feud in the most literal sense, a pretty much ongoing war between individuals or houses that are sanctioned by law. Therefore, a noble that inflicts a particularly grave injury on a peasant, be it physical or his pride, by, say, for example, making him walk like a dog in front of us all, all of his friends and family, that peasant can, technically speaking, launch a feud against the noble and carry out a revenge on him. That is, well, is slash should at least be roughly equivalent to the injury originally suffered. Albeit, note, the one inflicting the injury need not be the one on the receiving end of the revenge. This is one of the smaller, unique elements of a feud compared to the rest of Gospodor law. For you see, whilst Ungor law has the idea of collectivized responsibility and collective guilt as well, that concept does not exist in Gospodor law. You cannot punish someone's member of a family for the crimes committed by another. However, within a feud, this is allowed up and including a certain degree of, um... Leniency, as to the picking of one's targets, according to opportunity and also the individual's own opinion. Let's say, for example, that he was ordered to walk like a dog because the noble's mistress thought it'd be funny. In these cases, it would be entirely reasonable to carry out the revenge against either or, as opportunity dictates. But of course, a peasant carrying out a revenge against a noble is rather difficult, although it does happen on the more fringe areas of Kislevit society, out in the oblasts where the boyars and the lesser nobles hold rule, the nobles tend to be far gentler than in the cities. 
for no other reason than because if they were to piss off enough peasants, uh, they will have considerably less backup than those who are allowed to live in the cities, which of course can benefit themselves off the Czechists, the state police force, the garrison, their own men, mercenaries, etc, 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 etc. More difficult to get a hold of many of these resources uh, further out on the border areas. Anywho, but in most cases, the idea of a feud is carried out between noble families, where one takes insult over something and then carries out a revenge for the perceived insult, even if one was not necessarily intended. And then, of course, the injured party then goes, Oh, how could you? And then takes revenge in return. And so it goes and goes and goes and goes and goes. And there is no technical limit to when a feud ends. Technically speaking, they can go tit for tat for as long as <laughs> the party wants to keep it up, really. And the only way for Gospodor law to intervene in this matter is if a legal ruling is passed down. Because whilst you are free to take offence at, well, <laughs> anything you damn well please, and therefore carry out a feud over that offence... This is between individuals or families, private entities. Once the state, represented here by the Gospodor court under the auspices of the Tsarina, steps in, then it is no longer a private concern. It is no longer a private feud, and you cannot take up a feud against the Tsarina. Or, well, you could, but it's literally a crime to disrespect her. <laughs> so, how well do you think that's going to work out? For all intents and purposes, once the Tsarina makes her ruling, via the courts of course, in her name in auspice, the feud is considered done so. This is essentially the Tsarina's way of stepping into the feuds between nobles and saying, nope, you can't do that, fuck you very much. And the noble families will have no choice but to abide by her say-so. Although, technically speaking, that just means that they'd have to find another excuse to feud, doesn't it? A uh, nasty glance thrown across the courtroom, for example. A half-perceived whispered insult, maybe. Though, most of the time, this is rarely continued once the Tsarina has entered the ring, because it is literally her stepping in in most occasions and going, no, stop it. And the noble families, unless they are very powerful indeed, and have a lot of friends to draw upon, they would not disobey the Tsarina, though it has and can on occasion happen. There are even occasions in which a court ruling has been ignored, and a feud continued regardless due to the grievous nature of the insult, but, well, it is for situations like these that we have the Czechist secret police, don't we? If you can haul the entire noble clan off the jail and lop all of their heads off, well, if one side of the feud is dead, you can't very well continue it, can you? Though even so, the feud system has caused Katarina a great deal of headache. She would like to abolish it, but she does not have the support amongst the nobles, who view this as a vital piece of their own right and independence to settle their own disputes. And considering the nature of Gospodor court, this is um, hardly surprising. You may remember in the Ungol episode that the guy presiding over the uh, court case, quote-unquote, had to be appointed by the Tsarina, or well, not appointed, excuse me, had to be accepted, had to be green-lit, rubber-stamped by the Tsarina, and she had to do this for every single court appointment in every single case of Ungol law. Something that, again, pisses her off to no extent, but... She'd be damned if she gave up the power, so that's not an option. In Gospodor courts, however, the Tsarina need not approve every single judge. She merely appoints the judges to their positions, and then the cases are brought to them. Now, imagine this from the perspective of a local noble who may not be on the Tsarina's best side. Would you bring a court case, a legal case, against someone that the Tsarina might like to a court where the Tsarina has appointed all of the judges? <laughs> 
No. No, ye wouldn't. And now you understand why the nobles are so very fond of the feud system, because in all due reality, it's probably the closest to justice they're likely to get. Uh, the, the, it might be unfair to be a peasant in Kislev, but it's just as unfair to be a noble as well. Remember, shit always rolls downhill. <laughs> Of course, the easiest way for the nobles to try to usurp this system would be to become judges themselves, something they absolutely can, because remember, the only qualification needed to become a judge in Kislev is to be appointed by the Tsarina. A sufficiently powerful noble family could certainly push for one of their own numbers to be appointed to one of the four primary courts. One in Kislev, one in Erengrad, and two courts in Prague. Because, well, that close to the northern border, things tend to get a little bit spicy, and the extra judicial oversight is not a bad idea. And some noble houses have also tried to do this, and some have even succeeded, but the problem is, at the end of the day, it is the Tsarina that makes the laws. And whilst the judge is more or less empowered to do anything and everything he wants, as long as it is within the general guidelines of the rules, that is still quite a lot of um, red tape that one would have to cut through were one to desire a bit more of a creative solution to a feud that may incidentally just so happen to favour a house from which the judge hails. And frankly, it's too much bother to be worth it for the vast majority of the noble houses, though a few do recognise the threat that a judicial system ruled entirely by the Tsarina and her creatures pose to them, but it is a problem for further down the line. There are plenty other power grabs the Tsarina is making, and this seems to be a relatively minor priority. Though perhaps it uh, really shouldn't be, because as mentioned, the judges have a great deal of power. They get to choose who may and may not speak. They get to determine what evidence is and isn't admissible. And at the end of the day, of course, they get to decide who is guilty and not, with absolutely no chance whatsoever to appeal. A judge's verdict is permanent and inviolate. Even if the judge is later found to have acted against the Tsarina's laws, usually because she changed her mind, the judgment still stands, it's just that the judge also gets put on trial as well. <laughs> uh, what, what a wonderful system. You still get punished, even if you weren't guilty, but hey, at least the contu sentence you get to burn as well, so... Something, isn't it? And considering the nature of Gospodor punishment, that might actually genuinely be something. Because it is, uh, much like Ungol law, extraordinarily harsh and, may I say so, barbaric. Now again, there are legal limits to what you can and cannot punish someone with, in that the law lays out a series of permissible punishments. You can uh, kill someone, you can have their hands chopped off, you can have them blinded, you can have them whipped, beaten, or torn apart by horses if you so wish. But you must choose a punishment from amongst the list of possible legal punishments. You can't simply invent something all on your very own, like for example execution by hammering a wooden spike up someone's anus until it pops out their front teeth. An actual execution method, by the way. <laughs> See, I say that the Kislevits are rather savage little bastards, but uh, we have on occasion been somewhat savage in our own history as well. However, here's the kicker. First and foremost, the one that decides upon the punishment is not the judge, you know, the legal professional, uh, quote-unquote. It is the injured party, the one that might be feeling the most malicious and vengeful towards the perpetrator. <laughs> All right, that's bad enough, but, you know, if there's reasonable punishments and limitations, then it's not, it's, it's not the worst thing imaginable, except hold on there, Skippy. 
Whilst the law does outline a series of permissible punishments, it does not in any way, shape or form categorize those punishments. And so it is entirely possible to punish someone uh, pissing in your backyard by having them raped to death by wild horses. <laughs> Harsh, but fair. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't even know if this was an oversight on behalf of the Tsarina, but let us be honest, it probably wasn't. In all too likelihood, the law was made this way for a very specific reason, namely to allow the Tsarina and those she favours to punish literally any crime against them as harshly as imaginable. If someone so much as farts in the Tsarina's general direction and she decides to take offence at that, that very individual may, that very same night, be tossed into a frozen lake with a heavy lead weight around his ankles. However, there is another limiting factor. For whilst there are no legal consequences to choosing the most extreme punishment imaginable, and by the way, again, there is no appeals process, there is no, uh, you know, saying, I don't want to do this, can I pay a fine instead? No, no, no. The punishment is always carried out, regardless of how ridiculously draconian it might be. Oh, and by the way, in addition to the corporeal punishment, an economical punishment is also <laughs> usually added on top of it. So, not only do you get beaten, you also get a fine, which is just, uh just, just the cherry on top there. However, whilst there are no legal consequences, there may be social consequences. If you go way beyond what is considered reasonable in the punishment of a crime, your peers might, uh, might decide to keep a little bit of more of a distance towards you next time. Or they might even decide, and this is the real nuclear option, the one that's supposed to keep the worst excesses in check, launch a feud against you. Now, as previously mentioned, you cannot launch a feud over a legal judgment, no matter how harsh, but again, feuds can be launched over literally anything. If a family decides to take revenge over what they seem as an unjust punishment, they'll just look for any excuse. Any, and they can take, again, virtually any excuse. And in the scenario of one party having enforced an unreasonable penalty upon another, and a feud begins, and then the other party goes, up, oh, you know what? We may have started this, but I think it's time to finish this one off. Um, how about we go to the courts to decide this one? And suddenly, of course, the party that was the injured party last time that enforced the unjust penalty, their social standing will have taken a rather massive dip. And so this time around, the judge may not be quite so amicable towards their claims. And... Again, just as the cherry on top, since they enforced an unreasonable penalty the first time, the sky's the limit for the other party when it comes to punishments. Now, of course, this is absolutely a system that can be game to high heavens and back again. If a family is in with a local judge, for example, they are practically bulletproof, as long as that judge can keep the Tsarina's favour, of course, not pushing it too much. But again, in a justice system where the judge is the sole singular arbiter, and the other party gets to enforce any penalty they want, and a feud can be started at pretty much the drop of a goddamn hat, literally, well, imagine the following scenario. What if a wealthy noble has uh, decided to get a bit of a reputation? Every time he walks down the street, he just looks around for anything that he might perceive as an insult. And when he finds one, he calls the individual out on that and demands that they meet him in a court of law. And then, since he's all buddy-buddy with the judge, the ruling, mysteriously enough, always seems to end up in his favour. But the punishment that he hands out is always considered to be the reasonable punishment, quote-unquote. Like, say, for example, just a fine. Now, this is another peculiarity of Gospodor law. The fine is split in half between the justice system, 
the Tsarina in all dear reality, and the victim. And so what is usually required is a doubling of the cost of any damages inquired. And of course, in the case of an insult, well, the, uh, the insulted party sets the fine, doesn't it? But, however, as long as this individual keeps it reasonable within, you know, relative limits, then not only can he keep getting away with this as long as he goddamn pleases, but he might also receive a reputation for merely just being a particularly zealous lover of justice. <laughs> no matter how harshly you might persecute those who oppose you, as long as you are doing this within the legal framework, then regardless of how many benefits and advantages you might stack on your side, as long as the punishment you require is considered reasonable by wider society, you're home free. Oh my. <laughs> And when you add to this the fact that um, nobles are not only allowed to, but in fact expected to enact particularly harsh punishment upon the peasantry well in excess of the damage done, and the fact that the nobles, at least in the more centralized areas, don't give a flying fuck what the peasants might feel about them or be angry about their unjust punishment, well... That is why, um, one mention in the Kislevit law book for the role-playing game, I believe, mentioned that the punishment for an orphan, a child breaking a noble's window, might be for that child to be blinded in return as a symbolic gesture. Well, you broke my windows, the eyes of my house, so I guess I'll have no other option but to put out yours with a hot poker. Excessive? Not by Gospodor standards, no. Entirely reasonable, in fact. And if I were to play devil's advocate here for a moment, fitting, considering the topic of the video, whilst these laws are most certainly <laughs> barbaric at best and downright savage at worst, and would have no place within a civilized land, Kislev is not civilized. It is savage, however, and it is barbaric. Even the more safe southern areas of Kislev are far, far more dangerous than most areas of the Empire, bar some settlements deep in the darkest forests surrounded by beastmen warbands. And in such a situation where you need the entire nation to be of unified purpose against an external enemy, you cannot tolerate internal divisions or threats. And if this means introducing a draconian legal system to maintain a rigid, stratified society, where the various groups have their own purpose and mission to fulfil, then so be it. Better to have a harsh nation than have no nation at all, one would think. Especially considering the nature of the opposition. It's not like chaos is going to sweep through the lands, offering up a restructure to the legal system and more equitable penalties. And whilst one can most certainly say that all of the benefits afforded the nobility are most assuredly unfair, and a lot of them are afforded to the nobility through ancient tradition, and because the Tsarina wants to make sure that her power is as absolute as possible as well, it is also the nobility's responsibility to protect the nation. All nobles are required by law not only to own and maintain weapons and armor, but also to train with them frequently. This is an absolute requirement in a land that lies this close to the northern frontier, and most noblemen take this as a worthwhile and honourable pursuit. Although some of the ones in the southern cities are starting to get awfully soft and hesitant about it, assuming that their northern bulwark will stand forever. You'd think that the fate of Prague would have thought them differently, but, uh, well, the lessons of history are always so damned short-lived, aren't they? And with that, I will wrap up this video on Gospodor lore in the frozen northern lands of Kislev. If you liked the video, please do consider leaving a like down below and a comment, and even better, 
Share the video around to others who may be interested. Until next time, I have been Arch, thank you all very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.